Hey, folks. Uh, I've got uh, a an admission to make. After I have an evening of drinks, I do not bounce back like I did back in the day. Uh, and that's why um, when I know that I'm going to go out and have a few drinks, I take some Z-Biotics. Z-Biotics is a pre-alcohol probiotic. It's the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by a PhD scientist to help you feel better the morning after drinking. And here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in your gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme that breaks this byproduct down. All you got to do is remember to make Zbiotics. It comes in a little like a bottle about yay size. Uh, your first drink of the night, you drink responsibly. You get some rest. You're going to feel your best tomorrow. Every time uh, I have uh, Zbiotics before drinking, I, the next day, I don't know that I had been drinking the night before. Hmm. I mean, except for all the crazy stories. <laughs> Um, uh, it doesn't matter whether I'm doing my show, whether I'm trying to, uh, exercise on those rare occasions. Um, I don't feel nasty like I do when I don't frankly, uh, drink Z-Biotics the night before. One bottle of Z-Biotics is equal to the cost of a cocktail, but nothing beats the price of a uh, morning where you can actually function. Go to zbiotics.com slash majority. Get 15% off your first order when you use majority at checkout. You can also sign up for a subscription using my code so you can stay prepared no matter the time or occasion. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they will refund your money. No questions asked. That is zbiotics.com slash majority 15% off your first order we'll put the link in the podcast and YouTube description and at majority.fm uh, now for the show the majority report with Sam Cedar the destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite Sam Cedar they are unanimous in their hate for me and i welcome their hatred we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex the majority report with sam cedar <laughs> and i get the feeling you've been cheated it is tuesday February 27th, 2024. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Ofer Kasif, member of the Israeli Knesset, representing the Hadash Coalition, Recently attempted to be expelled from the Knesset for supporting South Africa's charge of a genocide at the International Criminal uh, Court of Justice. But first, we will have a news day. Michigan primary day today. The big question is how many people will vote uncommitted in this primary? We're also three days from a partial government shutdown, and Senate Republicans think Mike Johnson is about to crash the government into a ditch. Joe Biden claims a temporary ceasefire in Gaza could come uh, as soon as next week, as Hamas and Israelis warn it very well may not. Yeah, he said that with an ice cream cone in his hand, by the way. <laughs> hey. Not joking. Hey, yep, I'm not joking. <laughs> FTC... The Federal Trade Commission blocks the Kroger-Albertsons merger on labor grounds, among others. Senate Democrats to force a vote on a bill to protect IVF rights. And clearing its final hurdle, Hungary approves of the <clears throat> Swedish NATO application. 
Sweden to head into NATO. Judge says the former Republican star impeachment witness must stay in jail uh, because he's a flight risk after having been indicted for false testimony. (laughs) Students uh, walk out of an Oklahoma school to protest next Benedict's death. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. It is a... um, Newsday Tuesday. Yes, but with a uh, uh, a twist. Uh, we have uh, Ofer Kasif. Uh, we've been trying to have him on for a while. He had some scheduling problems, and, he, and then yeah. um, the various things came up at different times, and uh, we'll be talking to him today at 1 p.m. Uh, we're going to get into the uh, Michigan primary um, and this FTC uh, lawsuit, which is um, actually the third lawsuit that has been filed against this attempted merger um, and making it that much harder for this merger to go through. But the reasons, the the reasoning behind uh, this lawsuit are um, as exciting as... <laughs> Exciting, maybe an overstatement. Well, no, it is exciting. But um, what's uh, more exciting? I mean, it's more the reasoning they give is even more exciting than the decision. And like the, argu- the fact that arguably, yes. I mean, well, we'll get into but it. But yeah. we'll get into <laughs> it. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, maybe exciting is, is an overstatement, but uh, around these maybe parts. Maybe for nerds like us. Exactly. Probably, around yeah. these parts. Um, we'll also uh, touch on the government shutdown. Uh, they say partial government shutdown by uh, Friday if uh, if Mike Johnson can't figure this out. But um, it's partial, but it's f- rather significant uh, in terms of the agencies that we're talking about. We will get to that as well. Um, and uh, we, I want to definitely uh, uh, talk a little bit about this, Alexander um, Smirnov, who uh, uh, this case is just going to, I think... Uh, I think I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about this going forward. But uh, first, since we're talking about Michigan today, um, here is uh, Sean Fain. He is um, he was on uh, CBS's uh, uh, or to, I guess I'd say uh, being interviewed by uh, Robert Costa from CBS. And uh, this is uh, now you know we have. Uh, in, in Tennessee, we have uh, uh, UAW workers at that um, uh, Volkswagen plant now have signed a, I think over 50% um, have uh, signed a uh, union card. Uh, we have a Mercedes plant. Where is that? Nashville, is it? Uh, in Alabama, uh, that is uh, being organized. Remember, Sean Fain has called for unions across the board to negotiate their contracts so that they all come up in the summer of 2028, uh, or particularly, I think it was May of 2028, May Day. Day. Um, So this is someone who is not just building the UAW, he is building the union movement across the board and um, taking on issues that are, you know, we have gone through a period where unions were... um, we're practicing a managerial style unionism where they were uh, focused on the transactions that they were handling with management as the primary core function of the union, and to, at least in terms of their relationships. And over the past 10, 12, almost 15 years, really in many respects, starting with uh, the late Karen Lewis and her organizing of the Chicago Teachers Union and their strikes that they held in 2011, there has been an increasingly um, burgeoning social justice unionism, which basically speaks to the issues not just of the specific members of any given union, but to uh, a class of people, of working class people across the country, and thereby you know, supporting a much wider, the aspirations of, of, of people outside their union and uh, creating this solidarity, which then comes back and supports uh, the union, um, uh, uh, the, the union demands um, that 
otherwise now are supported by a, a, a greater sense of, of class solidarity. And here's Sean Fain, um, asked by Robert Costa, like, I don't know, it's a weird co question, but uh, I like the answer. You're mild mannered, you're professional, you have glasses on. Nice. Pause guy. it for one second. He is not mild mannered whatsoever. Well, let me just take an <laughs> exception about the whole glasses thing. Yeah, Sam's yeah. not mild mannered and he has glasses on. Well, I, like, what, like, what a weird thing to say, though. You're not wearing contacts. Mm -hmm. You haven't gotten LASIK. Like, what is, like, what, like, Sam, see, like, when I'm like this, I'm a bitch. But here's or, the thing. No, no, no. And then I, when I put these on, look. Right. right? Totally Nerd different. But, Total but, but here's the point is that. <laughs> For so many, not just uh, Robert Costas, but uh, you could see this, you know, uh, across the ideological spectrum. Um, working class is supposed to be some type of aesthetic. Yeah. Working class is supposed to be uh, a specific skin color. Uh, the working class is supposed to have a specific, you know, accent. The all of this, and that is just He's farting. He, he, in front uh, of people. It's it's just it's it, that is. Um, that is a brain tick yeah. and yeah. and there may be actually you know more to that tick but but we see that across the board right all right but go ahead you're mild mannered you're professional you have glasses on nice guy but you also rail against the billionaire class and you wear t-shirts at times that say eat the rich i don't think billionaires should exist no one needs that much money i think it's inhumane Pick any city, walk around, you know, you see people starving, people without basic necessities. There's no excuse for that. And it's not because people are lazy or don't want to work. The billionaires that keep amassing more and more wealth so they can build rocket ships and do whatever the hell they want to do, that does nothing for humanity. Your critics say that's class warfare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, class warfare has been going on in this country for the last 40 years. The billionaire class has been taking everything and leaving the working class with nothing. So it's you all, welcome it. You so want the all, war. It's always, whenever working class people ever step up and say, this is wrong, we want it to stop, all of a sudden, oh, it's class warfare. It's the end of the world. If you're mild-mannered. Yeah, there you go. Um, I mean, it is, it is, it is, I can't remember. I mean, I, you know, there's times where you've heard Bernie Sanders speak like this. Uh, but I don't, I just don't remember anybody else allowed to go on television have a one-to-one -one interview like this and express these things yeah i just i don't the the combination of someone who has actual you know some measure of power certainly somebody who's coming and representing labor but to uh warrant a you know a one-on-one -on -one, uh, you know interview with uh a type of situation it just i i, I haven't seen this in years yeah and it's also helpful to have it outside of uh the the kind of traditional political conversation where it's not a guy that's a senator or a representative who's saying this kind of stuff it's a union leader i think that that appeals and, and can reach a different kind of audience than even if bernie sanders was saying it right absolutely yes and the, or and, aoc and, to her credit because she did go on right. tv and say billionaires shouldn't exist fair enough uh, uh true but to see someone who is not an elected official and has both access to these type of platforms yeah. Uh, and carrying this message uh, and some ac and access helpful. to the president. I mean, yep. Biden had to come to him. Yep. So he's he's flexing in a good way. And how, do, how? Yeah, exactly. Everyone wants to know how are we empowered against all these people who control the world, the billionaires. And this is getting him out there saying, like, actually, in a union, we reopened a plant that they shuttered uh, with strikes like that is an, an incredible flex. And it wouldn't none of this would be possible if they hadn't had such a successful campaign last year. hundred percent. Right. And um, we will be talking more about um, labor in the context of this FTC case, um, where the sort of convergence of, of two of the some of the uh, high points of the Biden administration uh, converge. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, first, a couple words from our sponsors. Oh, now I'm hungry. Uh, <clears throat> Cashews, almonds, pecans, pistachios, dried mango, crystallized ginger, dates, jelly beans, jawbreakers, root beer barrels. Yes. Stop it. <laughs> I'm talking about nuts.com. The variety is vast there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 
Please uh, join me in thanking Nuts.com for supporting the Majority Report. And now, uh, please let me damn them from being now getting me on <laughs> thinking about exactly. nuts and candy right now. Um, right now, when you go to nuts.com slash majority, new customers are going to get a free gift with a purchase and free shipping on orders of $29 or more. Nuts.com is your one-stop shop for freshly roasted nuts, dried fruit, sweets, pantry staples, like specialty flowers and more. They've got a wide selection. That means that there is something there for everyone. And at nuts.com, the the best part about this place is quality is their top priority. They roast their nuts, they pop their corn in the same day that it ships. So it reaches you. It is incredibly fresh. Satisfaction, of course, is guaranteed. Um, we have torn through uh, almonds, and cashews here and mixed nuts. Um, I got to see if they actually have like a subscription thing. I don't know if they do, but that would be amazing because I run out of them and then I forget to order and then I get reminded right in moments like this. But nuts.com, uh, on top of all those other things I mentioned, they offer uh, gluten free options, they offer organic options, they have other diet friendly products if you want. Doesn't matter if you're looking for something sweet. Doesn't matter if you're looking for something savory or you need to stock up on everyday cooking essentials. You are going to find uh, what you need there and maybe something else to try. You can shop a la carte at any time or opt into the hassle-free auto deliveries. That's what I got to get. Oh, yeah, I know. That's So why that out. way you never run out of your favorite items and you're already stocked up at home and they sell directly to businesses. Right now, Nuts.com is offering new customers a free gift with a purchase and a free shipping orders of $29 or more at Nuts.com slash majority. So go check out all the delicious options at Nuts.com slash majority. You're going to receive a free gift and free shipping when you spend $29 or more. Also, uh, sponsoring the program today, 80% of men are going to experience hair thinning in their lifetime it is normal, uh, but it doesn't have to be your fate. You can get ahead of thinning with Nutrafol. And that's exactly uh, what I have done. Um, I started taking Nutrafol about a year ago. I've talked about this. I mentioned this yesterday. Uh, they they wanted to advertise with us a couple years ago. I wanted to know if uh, Michael was interested. He was a little thinning on top. He wasn't. Uh, and at that time, I didn't feel like it didn't even occur to me. Then about a year, maybe a little more ago, I started feeling like I'm one half of my head and the hair was getting a little mm -hmm. thinner and you know, I'm, I'm getting up there. I'm getting old. Uh, but, uh, I want to keep my hair. So I started taking it and the, uh, beauty of Nutrafol, it is, uh, a hair growth supplement. They are physician formulated. They are 100% drug free ingredients. Their patented technology provides consistent, reliable results without compromising your sex life. And uh, in terms of efficacy, you can uh, you will look at supplements. They test the ingredients, but they never uh, test the combination of ingredients. And Nutrafol clinically tests their final formulations to ensure their efficacy. In a clinical study, 84% of men showed improvements in their hair after six months taking Nutrafol's men's hair growth supplements. Head over to Nutrafol.com slash men, take their hair wellness, hair wellness quiz, and you'll get a personalized hair health plan based on your specific root causes. No pun intended. Uh, with Nutrafol, building a hair growth routine is simple. You purchase online. There's no prescription or doctor's visits required. Free shipping and automated delivers ensure you'll never miss a day. You will see results within three to six months. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement brand has over 1 million people seeing thicker, stronger, faster growing hair with less shedding. Take the first step to visibly thicker, healthier hair for a limited time. Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping. When you go to Nutrafol.com slash men, enter the promo code TMR. You can find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. Nutrafol.com slash men, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com slash men. Enter the promo code TMR. That's Nutrafol.com slash men, promo code TMR. All right. Um, oh, and also, I want to remind folks, we'll put a link again 
to that GoFundMe. Uh, a, uh, the, the GoFundMe is uh, being run by a, uh, a, a Palestinian now living in Belgium. Uh, he lived in Gaza uh, up until I think it was uh, maybe six to eight, ten years ago. Um, uh, moved to uh, Belgium, was able to uh, leave Gaza. His family uh, is still there, and uh, uh, he is organizing this to uh, help this family, and and in particular because they have a daughter who has Down syndrome, and as um, I don't know, it is. Um, the, the, the suffering is so widespread there. Um, but this is an opportunity to do something concrete as, you know, uh, and direct for a family that is, is trying to get out of Belgium. And I think, um, uh, we're going to have Muhammad who's, uh, who is, uh, in Belgium going to be on the show on Thursday with Emma. Uh, but, uh, we'll put a link to that at the, uh, in our podcast and YouTube description. All right. Um, Let's get to uh, Michigan primary day. This is um, the big issue in Michigan is going to be how many people vote for uncommitted. Yep. Um, Because Trump and Biden obviously will run away with it. There's no chance Nikki Haley even makes it interesting. And I think uh, who else is going to be on the ballot in Michigan? It's just Dean Dean Phillips. Phillips. And um, the... um, there, there was something like 1.5 million people who voted in the uh, Michigan primary in 2020. And that primary um, was just as or just before that primary was still in it, like when the primary was still actually happening right. in 2020. You'll recall, like we didn't shut down until like around, I think it was March 13th or 14th or somewhere around there in 2020. Um and it's anticipated that there may be a little bit more than a million uh, voters uh, in total, maybe more, uh, in, in, in this uh, Democratic primary. There's already been a lot of uh, early voting. Um, but there has been an attempt, uh, and this has been ongoing for a couple months, to vote for uh, uncommitted as a way of protesting um biden's policies regarding israel there is obviously a huge uh in michigan uh muslim and arab population uh i think close to three hundred thousand. yeah this is not a monolithic group i mean we have uh, people from many different countries uh but um an important voting block but really what's really going to be telling is how much this uh, voting for uncommitted moves out to younger progressives is really uh, because alone, I don't think you can see uh, uh, this. Um, Marion, I guess, uh, Williamson still on the ballot in Michigan. Uh, but voting uncommitted, in my opinion, is going to be the best way to express Absolutely. to the Biden administration. Here is a, uh, a clip. This is from Friday. Uh, this is a uh, re- uh, courtesy of CBS News Detroit's uh, Ibram Samra um, in uh, in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, and um, she's speaking. Uh, this is uh, well. Here, listen the, to this. This quote. is a survivor. I don't think she says it's. A, it's a survivor of the 1948 Nakba. She's an older woman, and she's pleading with the Biden administration. Message. Um, to Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. Oh, this is a different question. I find it so strange oh, no, it that our president would veto a ceasefire. People are dying. Over 30,000 has already died. What more? We are angry. We are definitely betrayed. And definitely, we should vote uncommitted. The Nakba has taught me is that I have to know my story well. First thing I did, I studied Hebrew. I went to Oxford University to do a PhD. I wrote the history of Haifa.
I became an academic, learning because they tell us you are not, you, you're not straight. I was told at UCLA clearly, no, no, you are biased because I'm telling the real story. Testimonies of people who told about what happened in 48, it can never be forgotten. We will never stop telling. Um, her name is May Sikile, uh, uh, I guess. Um, and um, the um, right now, there's there's polling in Emerson polling. Do you want to read off some of those numbers? Yeah, uh, let me pull it up right here. Actually, um, it's not right in front of me, okay. but well, I can I can I, I can give you a sense just because from memory, largely. Here you go. Um, so I it believe. I believe that 9% plan, or, here we go, 9% in advance are planning to vote uncommitted today, but there are 12% who are undecided. So that range is, I think it's going to be more, if I were to guess right now, than 9%, but um, that requires people to show up. But I would imagine that a good percentage of that 9% already voted early, as you say. 28% of voters under 30 plan to vote uncommitted. So when you're talking about mobilizing young people, this is not just Arab Americans or Muslim Americans. This is our young people who are trying to, to uh, pressure Biden in this way. And so if you're in Michigan today and you're listening to this, I'd really encourage you to go out. Um, I know that electoralism in the face of this genocide, it seems like, you know, you're pushing a boulder up a hill and then it's just going to roll back down on you. Uh, si what was the name of that myth? Gosh, Sisyphus. Sisyphus. I wanted to say syphilis, but that's not. Um, anyway, that's not it. But but yeah, um, I'd encourage people to do that because there was a bit of a, a, a last ditch effort in New Hampshire to write in ceasefire. And um, those votes were I, it, I don't know what the final tally of that was, but this has been a. a a longer campaign and Rashida Tlaib is endorsing it and, and part of the um, the movement behind it. I heard this morning. I think Andy Levin is too. Uh, yeah, there's Paul. a lot of Democrats in Michigan who have to respond to these constituencies from like a state electoral perspective that are endorsing this that you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. And Abdullah Hamoud, who is the mayor of Dearborn, he uh, I, I was listening to NPR this morning, um, had a quote where he uh, um, paraphrasing was saying, we may not be large enough to swing an election, but we are um, large enough to lose an election. And that portion of Arab American voters could actually literally lose Biden in the election. So his internal numbers seemingly doesn't seem to be swaying him. But we've seen that. We've seen this before. We've seen this movie before. I mean, we will, uh, w w you know, the it depends on which uh, reporting you believe, but there is um, at least some reporting um, that they are nervous um, in the, um, this is from a political playbook. They are freaking out about the uncommitted vote, said a Democrat close to Biden. This is going to create, I mean, if you start to see the numbers, now there were 20,000 people who voted uh, uncommitted in um 2020 now that was out of 1.5 so you can do the math there better than i can probably but that's that's you know uh seven percent um maybe uh six percent but if you start to see like nine ten percent if you start to see a hundred thousand people vote uncommitted mm -hmm. um in this uh in this election because, I mean, again, it's one thing for people to come out and vote uncommitted in a race where there's a lot of people, there's a lot of excitement, you know, that, that there was a lot of uh, primary contenders at that time. You get people to come out who are coming out specifically to vote uncommitted. And they, we're talking about 100,000 people <clears throat> in uh, Michigan. That's a big deal. Because... Um, Biden won Michigan, uh, what was it, a couple hundred thousand? 154,000 votes. Uh, but Trump won in a, with by 11,000 in 2016. Um, and so that was a three percentage victory by Biden in 2020. That, I, are we convinced that turnout 
broadly will be what it was in 2020 i don't know don't so know. then when you have fewer numbers yep. those num the, the the percentages start to to make more of a difference also um one thing that would be interesting to note is you know uh 28 of voters under 30 plan to vote uncommitted i'd be curious as to what 20 what percentage of, of voters under 45 mm -hmm. um because the electorate is getting younger this electorate is going to be younger because you're starting to see the greatest generation and the boomers in particular right this was a uh, when you compare you know gen x my generation tiny relative to the boomers and the millennials and um when the millennials begin to gain on boomers which is going to be happening this cycle the next cycle the cycle after that the boomers are going to be uh, by the you know within 12 years the boomers are going to be largely uh a a rump uh generation and it's going to be about millennials uh but that's starting to happen so it would be uh, 28% of voters under 30, 15% of voters under 45. That's a big number of votes. Oh, yeah. Uh, particularly in this election. So we shall see. We shall see. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. How much influence will that have on, on Joe Biden? Well, he was on Seth Meyers last night saying he was a Zionist. So um, not that much. Yeah. We'll, um, we'll, uh, not enough right now, at least. Hopefully soon. <laughs> I want him to see results and get freaked out. Let's skip the Super Bowl. Let's skip the Super Bowl. Interview Drill, and Seth Meyers. I just want to address this. Drill on the IM said the 2012 uh, Democratic primary had under 200,000 votes total. That was the year where the Michigan primary didn't count, I believe, uh, because they had um, the because there was some issue with the DNC. So uh, I think you got to really look to 2020 uh, before you, um, uh, and maybe even 2016. Uh, 2012 is, is just not an operative year. That's, uh, it was a, uh, a unique situation. Um, uh, briefly, we're looking at, um, a potential government shutdown. Maybe we'll talk more about that, uh, tomorrow, uh, or on Friday, frankly. Um, but, uh, this is, we're, we're back to where we've been. The uh, Congress is not even in session. Senate, uh, negotiators, you know, depending on w what time it is uh, announced that they think they have a deal that uh, Mike Johnson can uh, uh, agree to, but uh, Mike Johnson is worried about losing his job. And so they're uh, completely frozen and it is rare. There is this type of occasion where it's going to be so explicit whose responsibility a government shutdown is. Now, with all that said, uh, we don't want a government shutdown. In addition to all the um, people who uh, suffer because they're not getting services, um, the federal workers are also uh, have to deal with this stuff. They can't go to their landlord and say, "Hey, I I'm not I'm not getting paid at the moment because there's a government shutdown. Will you right. take your rent uh, later?" Uh, they could say it, but uh, landlords tend not to give a crap about that kind of thing. So um, that is a, a problem. But uh, let's talk about this FTC. Uh, lawsuit because this is a big deal um we've talked about lena khan and the ftc quite a bit the uh you also have uh, uh Cantor and the doj uh antitrust division this administration has been um very strong in terms of antitrust in fact it's completely revived the theory of antitrust that existed prior to the 1980s and a uh, Reagan administration adopting the uh, Robert Bork version of, uh, of antitrust, which limited the question of monopolies and finding something to be an illegal monopoly and an illegal antitrust down to the question of whether it saves the consumer money or not. And um, A, very hard to predict that in the final analysis uh, when you allow for a monopoly. But B, it completely discounts all the other reasons why you don't want a monopoly in our society. Uh, it is bad for competition. It creates wealth inequality. Yep. It uh, diminishes the power of labor. Um, Makes it, working conditions more difficult for them as well. 100%. And um, so the 
the um, the change in just perspective, in ideology, in the definition of of what the standard should be to determine that something is an illegal uh, monopoly. Uh, have changed under this administration that permeates also the judges because the judges get that notion because this is, there's a flexibility here and we've seen it uh, but this is the first time more or less in my lifetime uh, well I mean well, I was a young kid uh, yeah. when uh, antitrust has um, has been you know uh, uh, has been adopted in this format whether it, it helps workers or whatnot. Well, Lena Khan, just to say for me, I was born in 94, right? Probably the best agency chair of my lifetime, like better than anyone in Obama or Clinton administration. Well, certainly in the context of antitrust, there's nothing, yeah. we haven't seen anything like this uh, from uh, Obama or uh, Clinton. Uh, Federal Trade Commission has sued to block, this is a $25 billion merger between Kroger and Albertsons. Uh, most of these are in the Midwest, I think, and maybe uh, out West. We don't really have uh, uh, these in the Northeast anyways. Not that much. Maybe. I'm not sure. But um, but one of the grounds for the lawsuit. Now, we should say there are three lawsuits. Uh, the FTCs now, um, there is one in Colorado, I think brought by the state, and uh, one in uh, Washington uh, State. Uh, excuse me, D.C., um and so there's three different lawsuits and to to actually have this merger go through you would have to now uh, if you're kroger and albertson's overcome and win all three of these lawsuits um but the ftc suit is uh, essentially foregrounding the idea of monopsony and that being uh not just that when Kroger's and Albertsons get together, maybe they, you know, it becomes a monopoly. They have too much market power within, you know, uh, other supermarkets around. But that as a buyer of labor, because they will be the, uh, have a, essentially a monopoly over buying labor. When you have a monopoly over buying, it's called a monopsony. Um, it then uh, diminishes the power of unions to negotiate. It uh, points to potential harms to labor markets and affirms that the bargaining table between unions and employers is a relevant antitrust concern. This is uh, uh, David Dayan and Luke Goldstein writing in the uh, prospect. Um, United Food Commercial Workers, um, I should say, inciting the opposition of the United Food and Commercial Workers to the merger, the FTC argues that unions can successfully pit competing grocery store chains against one another as a strategy to gain leverage during bargaining negotiations. If you don't have multiple companies that are running supermarket chains, you can't pit them against each other in terms of, uh, of, of uh, creating leverage in your negotiations. Um, FTC pointed out in its announcement, union grocery workers' ability to leverage the threat of a boycott or strike to negotiate better CBA terms would also be weakened. By eliminating the current competition for union, gr union grocery labor between Kroger and Albertsons, the proposed acquisition would prevent the unions from being able to play them off each other during collective uh, bargaining negotiations, substantially increasing uh, Kroger's negotiating leverage. In other words, one of the problems of a monopoly in this instance is that you also, in terms of buying labor in this instance, you also have a monopsony and that uh, diminishes the power of labor. Um, there are other issues in terms of like um, uh, no poach agreements uh, and, um, and, and and just simply their, um, the impact on consumers. There won't be any competition. But the idea that they're citing this uh, labor component as an important part of this antitrust uh, action is um, exciting. Is 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 exciting and uh, important? They had done this uh, apparently in the context of Penguin House and Simon and Schuster, um, the concept of monopsony, right? right? Because there's fewer uh, publishing houses to essentially buy books. Um, your publishing house. You're a buyer when it comes to writers. You're a seller when it comes to the consumer. And, and 
the the on the buy end uh they would have a monopsony and so it was shut down here here we're seeing it uh, in the really an explicit um uh a part of the agenda by the ftc is to maintain and uh to maintain unions uh strength in terms of having leverage over management and that's really important yeah um it's it's really important that they're taking a much more holistic monopsony focused uh like lens towards the market as opposed to just seeing monopolies as uh in some way uh affecting the consumer because we see now it's just insufficient to analyze the strengths of some of these corporations that can provide the lowest prices but still be economically uh uh harmful in other ways because they just have the power to do so yeah like these I, I big mean, chains like walmart etc ultimately it's a question of, of democracy it's a question of wealth inequality it's a question of uh you know uh, protecting workers um and protecting us as citizens not merely in the one sort of sliver of us as consumers yeah um <clears throat> as workers too and exactly um so uh all right, let's uh, move on. Oh, this is um, this announcement was made uh, earlier today by uh, Tammy Duckworth, and um, so it was uh, Duckworth and Murray who are reintroducing a bill that they had introduced in 2022, which uh, basically protects the rights of of people who want to do IVF treatment. And uh, in 2022, it was completely shot down by the Republicans. It didn't go anywhere. Uh, They're going to try and force a vote on it in the Senate here. Um, It will not pass in the House, although it might. Um, This is really important because uh, uh, we've seen in Alabama, uh, the uh, Alabama Supreme Court say that uh, IVF is, uh, is banned because of its essentially by saying that there is um that a uh fertilized egg is a person right and the uh, person who can survive in a freezer for you know 10 years cry cryogenically a frozen person um but this is this bill you know i would love to see a bill that was even more explicit about personhood but uh this is a good bill and here uh, is tammy duckworth's announcement women at risk you know i was stationed in alabama for a bit when i was in the army in fact it's the home of fort Novacell, the home of army aviation i didn't know it at the time but my infertility would become one of the most heartbreaking struggles of my life my miscarriage more painful than any wound i ever earned on the battlefield so it's a little personal to me when a majority male court suggests that people like me who are not able to have kids without the help of modern medicine should be in jail cells and not taking care of their babies in nurseries. I know I'm not alone when I struggle to understand how politicians who support this kind of policy can possibly call themselves pro-life. After Roe v. Wade was overturned, actually even before then, when Donald Trump promised to only appoint justices who would overturn it, I warned that red states would come for IVF, and now they have. But they aren't just going to stop in Alabama. Mark my words, if we don't act now, it will only get worse. That's why tomorrow I'm headed to the Senate floor to call on my colleagues to pass via unanimous consent my Access to Family Building Act, which would ensure that every American's right to become a parent via treatments like IVF is fully protected, regardless of what state they live in, guaranteeing that no hopeful parent or doctor is punished. What's also interesting in this uh, bill is it would establish an individual's statutory right and I'm reading from uh, the uh, the statement from uh, Duckworth's office, Uh, the use or disposition of their reproductive genetic materials, including gametes. Now, Google tells me that gametes are reproductive cells. Um, They could include a, a sperm cell or an egg. And certainly, if you have full control over your sperm and your egg, uh, you do once they come together as well. Um, And, I mean, personally, I would like a bill that says 
Yeah. We are going to, uh, you know, from a statutory perspective, if you want to believe that a, a fertilized egg is a person, you are welcome to. But from a statutory standpoint, from the question of law, that is not a person. That is not uh, someone who can go out and vote or walk or talk or crawl or whatever it is. It's not even um, a fetus. It's not a fetus. <laughs> it's, it's not it's even not, a fetus. Um, and the fact that Duckworth introduced this all the way like two years 20, ago in exactly. 2022 already, she's not lying that she anticipated that this was going to happen. And I like the I like the tactic of trying to force the vote um, on this because it doesn't give the Republicans hopefully an opportunity to kind of um, catch their breath on this because they understand like they are so concerned about the suburban white woman voter. That is the battleground for the Republicans. And I think Biden's campaign has a better sense that they'll go more towards him. This is not good news for that at all. Going after IVF. Um, so this puts the Republicans in a bad position. And I like that about the bill. Um, plus the substance of it as well. Uh, let's um, uh, turn. Uh, we're, in about 15 minutes, we're going to be talking to uh, Ofer Kassif. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Donald, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Joe Biden was on um, Seth Meyers last night. There were protests in 30 Rock, I believe. Yep. Um, Which is uh, incredible because he did not publicly disclose. It was a supposedly a surprise appearance. And there were um, dozens of people, I think, who were arrested um, in protesting uh, uh, Biden's visit there. And, uh, here is, uh, Joe Biden on Seth Meyers, uh, show. And, uh, you know, there's, you, you see commentators going like, who's advising him to say this? Right. Nobody. So he, and you'll about to see, he'll, he restates the same thing that we've heard about Zion, how he's a Zionist. Okay. He doesn't need to say this. If Obama were president right now, I guarantee T you, he would not be taking this posture. We know this from the substance of it. We know that he was more adversarial towards Netanyahu. We know that he went on freaking Pod Save America in November or October and called it an, an occupation. Biden doesn't even call it an occupation, which is factually the case. He takes this tactic, which is like extremely ideological and repeats what he seemingly has been saying since he met Golda Meir in 1973 and he pretends like this or not doesn't pretend it this made a huge impact on him and he hasn't updated the software since that point Seth Meyers's question is extremely mild he doesn't follow up at all but I'm glad he asked it and uh this is where Biden's at I want to ask about the situation right now in the Middle East you've forcefully spoken about the horrible events of October 7th and how Hamas is a continuing threat to the safety of the people who live in Israel. You've been negotiating, trying to negotiate the release of the hostages. At the same time, you've said that the response in Gaza is too much and that the loss of an innocent life in Gaza is just as horrible as the loss of an innocent life in Israel. And yet there have been calls for an immediate ceasefire. You have not supported those calls. Again, you seem like an optimistic person. Pause you it for one second. I just also want to reiterate, it's not just a question of not supporting calls. Or, the United States has actively uh, stopped the UN from, has vetoed now three, three resolutions times. calling for ceasefire. Three times. You have not supported those calls. Again, you seem like an optimistic person. You believe maybe there's a future for a two-state solution. But from where I'm sitting, it does seem like there doesn't seem to be any appetite for that right now. Do you see what is... Because, again, we see this horrible... Every day we see these horrible images out of Gaza. And is there a path forward? Is there a safe future for the people who live there? There is a path forward with difficulty. But here's the path forward. Look, first of all, there are... The hostages being held must be released. And if we've got a, at least a principle agreement, there'll be a ceasefire while that takes place. Ramadan's coming up and there's been an agreement by the Israelis that they would not engage in activities during Ramadan as well in order to give us time to get all the hostages out. That gives us time to begin to move in directions that a lot of Arab countries are prepared to move in. For example, Saudi Arabia is ready to recognize Israel. Jordan is Egypt. Uh, there's six other states I've been working with. Cutter. I need to and pause. We need to pause for a sec. Um, so notice how 
Palestinian self-determination isn't even... Well, he hasn't even said the word Gaza or Palestine. No. Or Palestinians. So why did Hamas feel that it was a not, they wanted to do, engage in this attack? In part, we understand it's because of the Abraham Accords, because the Trump administration thought it was a good idea to move forward by going and trying to normalize relations between Saudi Arabia, a major country in the Middle East, without the participation of the Palestinian people and their representatives. Biden is continuing with this, a Trump administration policy that has contributed to inflaming tensions when he mentions all, all of these Arab nations that are set to recognize Israel, you know, basically forced to under the weight of U.S. imperialism and power. This is... The, he hasn't mentioned Gaza once yet at this point. So I, I just want, like, when, when we talk about normalization in that way, that the, these are the conditions that also created the violence on October 7th that, that happened to Israel. Egypt, uh, there's six other states. I've been working with Qatar. And the, the bottom line is that I'm not, I think the only way Israel ultimately survives, and I make no bones about it. I get criticized for having said a long time ago, you need not be a Jew to be a Zionist. I'm a Zionist. Where there's no Israel, there's not a Jew in the world to be safe. But here's the deal. They also have to make, take advantage of an opportunity to have peace and security for Israelis and Palestinians who are being used as pawns by, 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 the, by Hamas. And so there's a process underway that I think if we get that, that temporary ceasefire, we're going to be able to move in a direction where we can change the dynamic and not have a two-state solution immediately, but a process to get to a two-state solution, a process to guarantee Israel's security and the independence of the Palestinians, but without them being able to, for example, invite in uh, you know, another country to provide their defenses. There's ways to do this, and I don't have time to go into it now, but, and in the meantime, there are too many innocent people that are being killed. And, uh, By Israel. Israel has slowed down the attacks in Rafa. They have to, and they've made a commitment to me, they're going to see to it that there's the ability to evacuate significant portions of Rafa. All right, pause, 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 pause. I'm sorry, I know we're near the end, but we have to note what he's saying there. First of all, he's not ruling out an attack on Rafa. He's not ruling out an attack on the big, the the the, the concentrated uh, refugee camp that is Rafa. He Biden is not ruling that out. <laughs> like oh, I just uh, want to uh, emphasize he that he seems to be saying it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Conditions. It's going to happen eventually. And then uh, I'm sorry. What was the second thing he said there? I totally I totally blanked on it. Um, uh, oh, the evacuation. That's when he's talking about. Clemson. So so that is that is a recognition that he's going to support the ethnic cleansing of, of, of Gaza in this way, yep. because that what does evacuation mean? That likely means going into the Sinai. I, I mean, I don't know if Egypt will, will, will do that. I, 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 but uh, beyond which, I would also say, um, talking about a process for a two-state solution, you just had a, uh, a vote in the Knesset, basically, uh, rejecting um, uh, anything like that. I mean, so this is all... It's, 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 it's fantasy. It's just, it's, it's cover. Uh, just continue and let's. Down the attacks in Rafa, they have to, and they've made a commitment to me. They're going to see to it that there's ability to evacuate significant portions of Rafa. Before significant they go portions. And take out the remainder of Hamas. But, it, but it's a process. And look, Israel has had the overwhelming support of the vast majority of nations. If it keeps this up without this incredibly conservative government they have, and Ben Gavir and others, most, I've known every major foreign policy leader in Israel since Golda Meir. Ding they're going to lose support from around the world. And that is not in Israel's interest. They, they lost support. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that because they are really yeah. horrifying yeah. scenes. All right. Yeah. That's yeah. how yeah. Seth yeah. got that interview. He's We're, not going to follow up. They're pariah. Well, we support them. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm not expecting much of the late night. He's a late night uh, I, He uh, said, actually seems well, like him and Colbert are kind of decent people. But like the the... Uh, yeah, it's a fantasy. I wish there would be one person. And honestly, like uh, somebody at one of these State Department briefings as well, who s asked the question, OK, so you're saying a two state solution is your stated goal. The uh, leader of Israel and everybody in the wartime cabinet is basically voicing incredible opposition to that and saying publicly that Netanyahu says his post-war plan does not include a Palestinian state. It's indefinite occupation of Gaza. Then the question is, 
how can you say that you support multi culturalism and that you support all these racialized ideals or uh, uh, multiracial ideals and that you're against racism as the democratic party and you still support segregation in the middle east by religion and by race because that's what a two-state solution actually means let's be real here um and israel is a pariah internationally the only reason that israel is still doing this is because of the diplomatic cover and arms that the united states provides if you talk to anybody in the rest of the world who's not in germany or the uk like or a western state the perception of israel is that it's a pariah state that is basically functioning as a, a part of u.s military interests in the region and it's totally out of control so they've lost not just the rest of the world but they've lost young people in this country forever I, I my generation will never ever be supportive of Israel in the same way that previous generations were. And so the fact that like Pelosi thought she was so slick last week saying, you know, oh, Netanyahu's a bad guy. That's what they think that their new tactic is. Th they're so behind the behind the times with that. It's got to be much stronger than just condemning the big bag at the top, bad at the top, because this is so structural. And in the end, you know, they don't have a real interest in changing things, and I think that's probably what I have yeah, to get into my, into my into uh, my. All right, all I just want to uh, also let's just uh, cover this before uh, Ofer uh, gets here. Um, the uh, two days ago, uh, no, yesterday, the Aaron Bushnell, he was a 25-year-old um, Air Force, uh, a member of the Air Force, U.S. Air Force, uh, died from wounds that were self-inflicted he lit himself on fire outside of the israeli embassy on sunday and um let's just play the clip that uh, cnn ran because i saw this on pbs as well and it is you don't often see um these this type of news coverage for this and and you can contrast it with um, msnbc's for instance and yeah, um, good job, uh, it is peace. you know uh, there's a lot of uh, you know a controversy around i guess the 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 idea of someone uh, doing a protest like this um and uh but i don't know from my perspective if someone's going to be uh, uh protesting in this manner at the very least you should uh honor uh their you know uh retelling it let people know about it um uh here is what cnn did we're learning new details today about a protest outside the israeli embassy in washington authorities identified aaron bushnell as the person who on sunday set himself on fire the 25 year old was an active duty member of the u.s air force cnn's gabe cohen joins us now with the details and, and gabe this is something that he did in protest. Yeah, that's correct. And we're learning much more about this 25 year old active duty airman, uh, Aaron Bushnell, as you mentioned, he's from San Antonio, Texas, and he live streamed his actions on Sunday in broad daylight on the streets of DC outside the Israeli embassy. We are not going to show that video. It is extremely graphic and disturbing. I have watched the video. I can tell you at the beginning, at the start of it, you can see Bushnell walking up to the embassy on the street in his military fatigues. Uh, he's speaking calmly to the camera. I wanna read a portion of what he says. He said, uh, quote, I will no longer be complicit in genocide. I'm about to engage in an extreme act of protest, but compared to what people have been experiencing in Palestine at the hands of their colonizers, it is not extreme at all. This is what our ruling class has decided will be normal. He then goes on to pour some sort of accelerant, it looks like, on his head out of a water bottle he was carrying, and then he lights himself on fire, Boris, and as the flames engulf him, you can hear him yelling, free Palestine, free Palestine, again and again, until finally he collapses, and that is when officers, you can see them race in, one of them with a fire extinguisher in their hands, trying to put out the flames, but it takes time, and as we have learned, uh, Bushnell died in the hospital at some point later on. Uh, and, and look, it really speaks to the tensions that are continuing to escalate around the war in Gaza, not just across the world, but here in the United States. We saw a similar incident. Um, <clears throat> we should also say that, you know, it's unclear. Um, I haven't seen much written about um, 
uh, Bushnell, that uh, too much at this point. Uh, but um, I do know that there are elements of the U.S. military that have been involved in like um, uh, drone flying drones uh, on right. behalf of Israel and this and that. And it's unclear, you know, what um, if he was actively involved in it or uh, was uh, anticipating having to be involved in it or whatever. Um, but I really appreciate Gabe Cohen and the way that he phrased that there and framed it because you don't hear. That, first of all, the word genocide was used on CNN. That's yes. important because um, that's what's happening. And two, like, you know, what MSNBC did was they just basically said, you know, he killed himself in front of the Israeli embassy and then put up the suicide hotline. Like, folks, I mean, of course, this is a, an extreme act of protest that pe I implore people not to engage in. Um, but just to paint with such broad stro uh, bro uh, strokes about mental illness, really, um, I think is a disservice to his memory and does the does the work of segment uh, of of isolating the human condition from our society and the choices that we make you know he felt that he needed to do this because oh. of uh u.s actions abroad and i don't want anyone else to engage in this it's horrific but the point is just that to say this is just a suicide attempt and this is just mental illness um is well, really reductive and also a lie. Well, it also, I mean, look, it makes no sense because um, we have tens of thousands of people who commit suicide a year in this country. Um, I can't do the math, but I'm, but, uh, but it's, you know, I don't know how many a, a, a day that is. Uh, maybe anywhere from, I don't know, 50 to 100 people a day uh, commit suicide and uh, MSNBC doesn't cover it. There's one reason to cover this. Uh, because it's an act of protest. And so that's the way that it should be treated. Otherwise, you don't cover it. Um, the idea that you're putting up uh, somebody uh, committed suicide today, and we want to just remind people that you shouldn't, um, uh, that uh, here's a helpline, um, uh, makes no sense. It, the, it is completely uh, contradictory, uh, con contradictory self-contradictory to uh, report on it that way. Either you don't report on it because it's a story of someone who commits suicide, uh, or you do. And uh, you you report on it because it's protest. Um, and should also say what I, I just struck me about this. And the PBS segment is actually even better than this uh, because they actually play uh, his uh, the the part of the video right up front uh, where he's talking about what he's doing. And you do see him. You know, I mean, look, uh, it, it I would not recommend watching the video. It, it is um, it is uh, difficult to watch. But as he is uh, in flames, he is yelling uh, free Palestine yeah. until he basically uh, uh, passes out. Um, and one thing that I did notice the CNN did not mention is that um, one cop came with a fire extinguisher. Yeah. Another cop came, uh, you know, pointing a gun at him. And you hear the, the, the cop who brought the fire extinguisher um, basically yelling at the other cops like, we don't need guns. We need fire extinguishers. Now, I mean, the it's... I don't know that they could have saved his life uh, at, at that juncture anyways. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it, it, it is a, uh, it, it, it was revealing. Yeah. Um, and the yeah. CNN report also, uh, sorry, Matt, just really quickly, does mention, good for them, that this was not the first act of this kind of protest in the United States. Uh, one happened in Atlanta regarding right. uh, Israel's genocide earlier, yeah, this, uh, a few months ago. Exactly. And I think Raphael Shimonov said this, if you're seeing Aaron Bushnell's bravery and helplessness in the face of horror in Gaza, thinking you should follow, I hope you realize we need you here with us. We celebrate him, but we are also deeply hurt and mourning. I wish we got to know him to organize with him and you. Um, and I think that's a, a really good way to put it. But I also will say, like, I don't think this is, this is going to be irrelevant to United States um, military planners' calculations going forward with regard to this thing. And I don't think people should diminish the this this uh protest might have had an effect um and uh someone in the uh, uh ims is saying it was an israeli official from the embassy pointing his gun not the cops um uh either way kind layers. of fitting <laughs> but uh, rest in uh, power aaron bushnell um all right do we need to take a break now yeah. uh, Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with Ofer Kassif. He is a member of the Israeli Knesset representing the Hadash coalition, uh, and recently uh, was there was an attempt 
to um, vote him out uh, to expel uh, him from the Knesset because of his support of the uh, International Criminal Court of Justice uh, genocide case against Israel. Uh, we'll be right back in uh, just a moment. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us now, Ofer Katsif. He is a, a member of the Israeli Knesset uh, representing the Hadash uh, 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 party. Um, uh, Ofer, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My um, pleasure. And I guess, I don't know, uh, congratulations uh, on surviving <laughs> uh, the vote uh, uh, the other day. Um, why don't you... Um, First, tell us what what was why was there an attempt uh, to expel you from uh, the Knesset? <clears throat> well, uh, according to a law that was enacted uh, eight years ago in 2016, which is by definition an anti-democratic uh, law, uh, 90 members of the Knesset out of 120 uh, that there are uh, by vote. There is a procedure, a process, which I will not, uh, you know, dwell upon at, uh, at the moment. If, uh, so, but eventually, the 90 members of the Knesset, if they vote to expel or impeach to another member of the Knesset, that means that member of the Knesset uh, is out. And uh, 
Everything began once I uh, signed the petition organized, initiated by some uh, <coughs> democratic Israelis. Uh, and eventually, by the way, there are almost uh, 1,000 uh, signatures of Israeli citizens, which, uh, and this uh, petition is in support of the South African uh, appeal to the ICJ. Uh, and there are two main components to this petition. One, is the, that the ICJ should uh, investigate what's going on in uh, Gaza, whether there is a genocide or not. There was a debate about it, by the way, because some people argue that the petition actually, actually says that there is, categorically speaking, a genocide. As far as I'm concerned, first of all, it's legitimate to say that, but as far as I'm concerned, the main so the main ap uh, appeal and the uh, petition uh, is to investigate because the government of Israel cannot investigate itself like any other government should not investigate uh, uh, itself. So this is one thing. And the other thing is uh, calling the ICJ to uh, uh, order the government of Israel to stop the war. And in my view, that's the most important thing in order to save lives and stop the bloodshed. Primarily of Palestinians who are killed by tens of thousands, not to mention the destruction and the injured, the lack of uh, the starvation, the lack of uh, water and medicine, hospitals, etc. But also in order to save the lives of Israeli soldiers and Israeli hostages who've been neglected by the government, not to say sacrificed by the government on the altar of its own survival. So that's the main thing of the uh, petition. Now, the uh, one of the fascist uh, uh, members of the Knesset, and uh, unfortunately there are many in this Knesset, and uh, are the, in the opposition too, because it was initiated by a member of uh, the opposition, but uh, is is trying to bypass the uh, government uh, from the right side. So uh, the, uh, his argument was that by signing this petition, I support armed struggle against Israel, which is totally, totally nonsense, not to say a, to, a, a you know, a total lie. So uh, in the bottom line, the request and the vote was to impeach me for supporting armed struggle against Israel, which again, it is, as I said in my speech, it is a kind of an Orwellian argument in which uh, lies are truth and the uh, war is peace and calling for peace and uh, and uh, uh, you know, stopping a war uh, means to uh, support uh, violence. That's crazy. Eventually, they didn't succeed. But just to answer, uh, to re refer to what you said before, I will not. Re I, I do not see it as you know something that uh, uh, deserves congratulations or greetings because out of 120, 86 members of the Knesset voted to impeach another member of the Knesset. It's not a personal issue. It doesn't matter if it's me or someone else. Only eventually for one's views. That's a classic, a clear-cut case of tyranny of the majority. So uh, let's um, uh, let's move from uh, the you know the the actions of your 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 favorite uh, your, your 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 fellow Knesset members, I guess. Um, but um, what? Uh, give us a sense of like, you know, uh, the w how, I guess, uh, alone you are in this perspective. Um, there is, you know, uh, some uh, uh, there are some who in, in this country who uh, argue that um, uh, those of us who are critics of the uh, Israeli government are uh, saying that the, the Israelis are a monolith uh, when it comes to this issue of the war. Uh, citing the the massive uh, protests that we saw earlier in the year about the uh, anti-democratic uh, initiatives that uh, that Netanyahu was taking, but it feels like in the context of um, essentially a desire for retribution against uh, Palestinians and and those in Gaza that there is a lot more uniformity uh or unanimity absolutely uh, talk to us about that and and and, and your sense of uh, of of what's going on with the israeli body politic look unfortunately the vast majority uh, of the citizens in israel uh, uh, have been supporting this assault on gaza which we have been against from the very beginning uh, first of all i must emphasize that uh, my colleagues my comrades and i in Hadash, 
in Hadash Tal, our faction, and uh, in some other uh, anti-war and anti-occupation organization of civil society, we've been all unanimously against totally the massacre committed by Hamas. Needless to say, it was a terrible carnage, a criminal, a crime against humanity, actually. Uh, on top of my moral, political, and ideological uh, opinion, uh, I personally lost some uh, friends who were uh, butchered by Hamas uh, so and kidnapped. Uh, so uh, obviously I want to say that uh, we, uh, we share total condemnation for the massacre committed by Hamas. But at the same time, and we, we've been saying, by the way, that the all crimes, and there are many of them, the all crimes uh, that uh, the governments of Israel committed uh, against the Palestinian people for so many years, and especially the ongoing occupation and siege on Gaza, do not justify the carnage committed by Hamas. At the same time, the carnage committed by Hamas cannot whatsoever justify the massacre that the uh, government of Israel carries out against the people of Gaza and still do. This still does, unfortunately. So, but the vast majority of the people in Israel uh, uh, support uh, the assault for different reasons. Uh, some of them be, uh, because they uh, still carried out by senses of revenge and hatred and, uh, and sometimes pain. Uh, and they are actually dominated by those feelings because everybody shares the pain and even rage. Uh, but uh, we do not allow those uh, emotions to control or dominate us. We we cling to our rationality. Unfortunately, the government of Israel, which is, a, by, let's say it very frankly and bluntly, this is a fascist government. And they've been using cynically the terrible carnage that Hamas committed as an excuse to wage this assault against the people of Gaza. And by that, to mobilize the public opinion to side with the government. The coup d'etat, the fascist coup that the government tried to pursue before the massacre under the sugar-coated term judicial reform is on now, but by other means. They've been cynically exploited, the carnage Hamas committed in order to continue with their fascist a, a, a coup. And uh, you can see it by the attitude towards the people of Gaza, but also the ethnic cleansing that goes on in the West Bank and the uh, total limitation and sometimes even total elimination of basic civil rights within Israel. Do you know, for instance, that since 7th of October, it's totally forbidden to demonstrate against the war, not perish the thought in support of Hamas, of course not, nobody does. But uh, to demonstrate in Arab cities and villages within Israel, not in the occupied territories, within Israel, it is totally forbidden and prohibited to demonstrate in uh, Arab villages and citizens against the war and, uh, and uh, for peace. It is not only a decision made by the police, it was upheld by the Supreme Court, this liberal Supreme Court, as it were, that we, like others, went out to demonstrate in order to defend it from the coup that the government tried to pursue before the massacre of October 7. So uh, uh, it's totally forbidden. Arabs are not allowed actually to demonstrate against the war and for peace, including people, by the way, that their relatives are killed in Gaza. They are not allowed. We are not allowed. Even when we could demonstrate in the city of Haifa, which is a mixed city, you know, there are Palestinians and Jews who live there. We were totally limited. We could not shout the, the slogans as we wanted. We could not raise the placards that we wanted. We were limited to 700 people. We couldn't march. We were compound to a, a specific area without marching. The police brutally uh, uh, attacked some of the demonstrators for different placards they carried, uh, they carried. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. People have been arrested and interrogated for Twitter, tweets and posts that called to stop the war and, the, and, the, and, 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 and expressed empathy for the people of Gaza. People lost their jobs and their, their studies at the university for the same things. 
So my persecution by the majority of the members of the Knesset is just part of a wider attitude goes on in Israel, which I refer to as a process of a fascist dictatorship. And I would imagine this also uh, contributes to the um, the Israeli population's uh, continued desire to essentially level Gaza uh, because there is no dissent that is even allowed to begin to sort of, I guess, um, uh, grow any feelings of uh, 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 that uh, there may be that there are uh, there are war crimes being committed that there this is a humanitarian crisis that there are you know uh, children Look, men women uh, starving. I must say that the Israeli society is very polarized. On the one hand, it seems that the majority, although the majority is getting say, smaller in my view. But there is still a majority that, as you said, that wants the, uh, this assault to continue, that believe the lies of Netanyahu and his bigots in the government that Hamas should be eliminated. Uh, we all know that this is impossible. Uh, it doesn't matter if I like it or not. Obviously, I wouldn't like to see bigots anywhere, not among the Palestinians. And Hamas is a fanatic organization, of course, not within the Israeli society or the American society or wherever. But... We know that it's uh, it's unrealistic. It, it is used as a slogan by, ne by Netanyahu and his thugs in order to find a reason to continue with the war solely in order to keep the Netanyahu and his government in power. But I, why did I say that there are uh, that the society is polarized? Because there are many people that. A protest against the war with all the limitations and the problems. There are many thousands of people who go out, especially during Saturdays ev evenings, uh, to demonstrate against the ongoing war, calling to release the hostages because they are dying there. As I said before, apart from the terrible death toll and destruction in Gaza of Palestinians, uh, the Israeli hostages have been totally neglected and sacrificed by this government. And many people, including families of, uh, of victims, of Israeli victims, some of them were killed, some of them were kidnapped, uh, they also go out to demonstrate against the war in order to, and calling to release the hostages and to stop the carnage. And the police is very brutal. Last Saturday, two days, uh, uh, three days, just three days ago, uh, there was a very big, thousands of people marched in the streets of uh, Tel Aviv, including families of hostages and uh, of uh, of uh, uh, and of the pe pe people who were uh, uh, murdered by Hamas okay. against the war, calling to stop the war, to release the hostages, etc. The police brutally attacked them. They attacked them with horses and uh, with bats and, and you know, uh, very violently because they actually do what Ben Gvir, this fascist, racist scum of the earth, they follow his instructions like and they, they do whatever he likes, although I uh, legally is not allowed to order them how to behave on the ground, but uh, practically they, uh, it does and they follow. And they just beat and arrested more than 20 people, including relatives of hostages and, uh, and, and victims. And the, at the end, but uh, so the polarization is here. And many people, will, Jews and Arabs, go out to the streets to demonstrate to stop the war and release the hostages and stop this terrible, you know, destruction. And then, and then, the, you know, Hazza is on rebels, and we all know that. What? Rebels and the, so, yeah, yeah, sorry. What is the level of understanding in Israeli society, from your estimation, about the conditions in Gaza now and before October 7th in terms of, um, you know, 50% unemployment, mass uh, uh, malnutrition, and now starvation? Because to me, as you say, there I do see these demonstrations. I, I, I see them. A lot of them are focused on the hostages, which makes sense. Cool. But... Um, what about the, you know, now 25 times more Palestinians now that we're near 30,000 um, who have been killed? Is that the central focus? I mean, where's the level of empathy within Israel? Uh, part of the polarization refers to that. I mean, I'm afraid that you're totally right. And uh, many, perhaps, 
most uh, of the demonstrators who call to stop the war uh, do that for, because they worry they are worried about the hostages like I do. I, I keep in touch with the families of the hostages. I know some people who are kept there and I uh, don't know what their uh, condition is. Uh, so I do, uh, of course, uh, sympathize and empathize. But at the same time, obviously, I'm totally against this assault on Gaza because uh, we all know, as you mentioned, the death of the starvation and all those uh, 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 crimes that go on in Gaza cannot be toler tolerated, to say the least. I mean, shocked that the international community primarily Biden's uh, administration don't do anything to stop that because they can. So, and this was part of uh, my signature on the petition. Uh, but uh, there are still thousands of people in Israel who are worried about the Palestinians too. And I'm talking about not only relatives of the Palestinians who live there or Palestinians in general, because as you know, the uh, Palestinian, uh, Palestinians constitute about 20, 21% of the citizenry in Israel. Uh, not only them, but thousands of Jews as well. Not enough. Not enough. Far from being not only a majority, but even a, a, a significant minority. But still there are. I give you two examples. Say, you know, two good friends of mine, which I admire and salute them more than I can say. One of them, uh, his parents, both parents, were murdered by Hamas. Another lost his son, who was killed by Hamas. And they are both very active against the occupation and against the assault on Gaza, not only though, though also, of course, because they are worried, like all of us, about the hostages, but also because they care about the lives and well-being of the Palestinians. And I salute them. They haven't lost their humanity, although they lost their dearest parents and son. What more than that? And they are not alone. There are many like, the, like, like them. And by the way, uh, they are attacked, even physically, not only by the police, but by rightist thugs, literally sent by Netanyahu and his companions in the government. What? I mean, uh, I, I talked, if, if, if I may, if, if, if I can just, uh, if you allow me, uh, sorry, because it's very, it's painful for me. So I, I hope you understand that I really want to get it out no, of, of my heart, you know. <laughs> A, a, a someone who lost his daughter, she was 26 years old, she was butchered by Hamas in this party. She went to party. She was killed by Hamas. And, and her father told me just the other day, it was yesterday or the day before, uh, no, yesterday, he told me that he gets messages from followers of Netanyahu, Ben Gvir, etc., who tell him we we hope that your daughter was raped before she was killed. That's the situation in Israel now. And I'm not talking about one or two persons. We are talking about hundreds. And they are not only tolerated by this criminal government. They are literally sent by some of them. A, a, a political advisor of one of the members of the Knesset from the Likud yesterday went to the, well, uh, there, 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 there are few tents by the Knesset of those families. Yesterday evening, a, a, a political advisor of one of the members of the Knesset for Alikud went to the tents and began to tear apart placards of those families, of those poor families. Those things go on and on on a daily basis. And I want you to remember that the violence is, a, 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 is on a rise and the violence it, it comes from the right towards the left mainly. We are on the brink of another political assassination like was with Rabin. I may be the victim, someone else may be the victim, but remember that very well because we are there and Netanyahu wants that. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Netanyahu's, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, motivations in, in a moment, but what, what, what would have been... And, and 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 maybe it's moot at this point, but 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 even going forward, but what would have been the alternate uh, response by uh, Israel uh, to this uh, that could have been pursued that um, uh, you would have supported? 
First of all, of course, the, the terrible carnage and the ongoing massacre in uh, Gaza following it was preventable. We all know that Netanyahu himself in person, and of course the bigots around him, especially now, uh, they wanted strong Hamas. They actually said so. Netanyahu said in 2019 explicitly that if one opposes the a, a Palestinian state, one has to weaken the Palestinian authority and strengthen Hamas. Even Smotrich, probably the, 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 the worst bigot in this government, and there are many, uh, he said in 2015, and I quote him exactly, word by word, he said, the Palestinian Authority is a burden, Hamas is an asset, end quote. And of course, it's not only words, they actually acted upon those words. Netanyahu kept Hamas alive, metaphorically as practically, by transferring money, huge amount of bin, millions of dollars from Qatar to Hamas throughout his years as prime minister. So they are responsible. There are many other layers to their the responsibility, by the way. But this is probably the main responsibility. If they would have done something for peace, which necessitates ending the occupation and the siege and Palestinian independence alongside the state of Israel, if they did something, that would have never happened. But they didn't. They are responsible for the terrible lot of everyone. Now, given that it happened already, the most important thing after the uh, uh, massacre, the disaster, the catastrophe of uh, the catastrophe of uh, October 7, the first thing that the government of Israel had to do is to release the hostages. There were 240 Israeli hostages. They should have be, uh, brought home immediately. Immediately. I want you to remember that Netanyahu didn't say anything about the hostages and about the, the end of the war. He, was to, uh, he didn't mention that the end of the war was to release the hostages. He said that the end of the war was to eliminate Hamas, just after a few days, even one week, when he saw that the public uh, uh, attention was given to the hostages and that the public opinion was to release them, then it was the first time they actually mentioned them as far as, as being the, one of the ends of the war. Uh, so that means what the, that shows and proves that uh, his priorities are totally different from what we would have expected from a, a, a humane person, you know. And uh, Let's, but that was the first thing. And, it, and, and of course, in order to prevent such disasters from happening again, the, there's only political uh, a, a solution, no military solution whatsoever. Everybody should accept that the fanatics should be, you know, isolated on both parties. No other way. What um, uh, uh, talk to uh, Netanyahu's um, uh, incentives here? Because uh, we know that he is, you know, facing criminal charges, and that um, cool. th those charges um, uh, obviously can't go forward, at least with the speed uh, and the intensity um, as they would if there if Israel was not engaged in this uh, assault on Gaza. Um, speak to his incentives, if if you could. There are two main incentives which are connected. First, as you implied correctly, uh, he is terrified of prison. He's a chicken shit, sorry for the words. No, he's, don't he's a coward. <laughs> he's a coward. He is he's terrified of prison. And he knows that, as, that uh, if the trial goes on, he will find himself behind bars. And justly so. He's a cook, to say the least. Now, he will do whatever, whatever he can in order to stay out of prison. He's ready to sacrifice everyone, everyone, including the Israelis. That's the reason, by the way, that I emphasize all the time that our struggle is not against the Israelis, it's against the government of Israel, 
because the government of Israel turned itself to be the main enemy of the Israelis and the people who live in Israel. The government is our enemy. Because Netanyahu, for his own interests, to stay out of prison, he has been doing everything at the expense of Palestinians for sure, but of Israelis as well. And at the expense, by the way, of uh, his allies in the United States, including the president, who may, you know, pay the price of losing his presidency only for Netanyahu. That's crazy. I simply cannot understand this, the sanity behind it, because there's none. Well, we can't understand and, it either. Oh, sorry, go on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so th in, in order to stay in power, he pays whatever the most uh, terrible bigots in his government actually want him to do. Including, for instance, there is still the danger of Israeli invasion to Rafa which is going to be a terrible carnage. Yeah. So, but, and nobody stops him. Uh, and we all pay the price. Um, well, I, supposedly there is going to be a reckoning, um, and certainly there was more talk of this a couple months ago. But do you have a sense, has there been much discussion within the context of the Knesset or amongst um, uh, in, in various circles in Israel, how this, uh, the, this attack on October 7th was uh, able to take place in what we, you know, uh, had been led to believe in this country was like the... Uh, the epitome of technological security. Um, mm. I mean, the uh, w what were the factors that allowed that <laughs> to to happen? Because it, it 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 at the very least, it's obviously a massive failure. But uh, I wonder if w how that's been discussed. Because it again, it certainly plays into the incentive structure for for uh, Netanyahu. Sure, exactly. Look, the main fiasco, the main failure is of Netanyahu in person and the government. Uh, it is a political strategic failure, not a tactical one. Now, but of course, in addition to that, uh, there, are, there were some failures, uh, technologically speaking. There, were, there was a, you know, a overlooking by uh, some, you know, chief. Uh, uh, generals, etc., from uh, messages and uh, warnings that came from below, uh, you know, from uh, lower ranks, uh, lower ranking uh, uh, soldiers. But that's the, as, as much as it is important, and it is, it is marginal in comparison to Netanyahu and the government's decisions. And uh, for instance, not too long before the massacre of uh, October 7, uh, Netanyahu uh, moved uh, uh, 32, I think, units, military units from the border with Gaza to the West Bank in order to defend illegal settlements and outposts. And so this is, of course, a, 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 pol a, a, a political and, and a tactic. A, a failure. But uh, the main thing is a political one. And of course, uh, uh, the transform, uh, transforming of those units from uh, the border with Gaza to the West Bank was driven by political things. You know, it, is, it, uh, it was mainly political because they uh, see the settlers in general and the more big the settler is, so even more so, as the main asset of this government, there are few class, you know, say classes among the citizens of Israel, and the and number one, you know, the uh, so-called the uh, nobility, quote unquote, of course, are the settlements, settlers. They 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 get whatever they like. Even now, you know, with the economic situation in Israel is so dire, given the war and the situation, even the new budget. A, a, a massive amount of money, one billion shekel, went to the useless office of a settler, or it's took, 
whose office has nothing to do really, that, that amount of money went to the settlements at the expense of those thousands and thousands of people who lost everything in the south of Israel and were and are literally refugees in their own country, and also thousands of people in the north that had to uh, 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 been, uh, be evacu- uh, evacuated from their houses and their cities and villages because of the missiles from Hezbollah, they hardly got anything for the, from the government. The vast majority of the budget goes to the settlements. They continue with the same attitude. And I'm afraid that the next disaster just around the corner. By the way, if I may, last March, exactly one year ago, March 23, there was a huge pogrom by settlers. On a daily basis, there are pogroms by settlers in the Palestinian village of Hawara. You know, they uh, uh, torched uh, some uh, houses, fields, etc. I sent a letter to Gallant, the Minister of Defense, and, uh, and, uh, and a, a formal letter in which I wrote that, of course, it is his own responsibility to stop and prevent such pogroms and crimes from uh, being committed. But I also warned that if the pogroms of the settlers go on, we are all going to pay in blood. I said so to the, uh, to the Minister of Defense one year ago, eight, seven months before the massacre. And later on, I sent him another, more or less, 10 letters of the same kind. I haven't got one reply for him, from him up till now. That shows you how it works. Yes. And I mean, the, the, the fact that there are uh, extremist settlers in high positions of power within Netanyahu's uh, sure. war cabinet, I think, speaks to the, the privileging of these settlers, as you say. What is yeah. the status of investigating the events on October 7th in terms of the uh, some of the first person accounts that we heard from the kibbutzes of um, potentially fire coming from non Hamas attacks um, in response where there there i i saw some quote that it would be respect disrespectful to the dead to look into some of this but you know what is the general sense of of how the israeli forces responded to october 7th and if they could be potentially culpable in some of the death so, uh, first of all there's no investigation in, uh, at the moment uh, the government and Tanya in particular uh, you know the minister but Netanyahu uh, first and foremost said that uh, uh, the investigation, uh, there will be an investigation once the, the war is over. Uh, uh, the war that Netanyahu doesn't want to, to be over, by the way. Uh, so there's no uh, real investigation at the moment, as far as I know, perhaps there's a kind of investigation which is classified, I don't know. I do not know, I do not have any idea about a serious, impartial uh, investigation, but uh, by any uh, institution or branch or anything else, uh, as 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 long as the responsibility of some military uh, <coughs> units or or generals or individuals to the death of uh, of Israelis, I really don't know what is the uh, 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 about how many we we we, are, we can talk. Uh, there is one incident that is quite clear cut that was mentioned many times by the media. Uh, a specific general who ordered to shoot a, a, a missile from a tank at a house in one of the kibbutzim uh, in which there were some uh, Hamas uh, uh, terrorists within the building with, together with 12 or 13 hostages. And, and, and of course, everybody was killed by this uh, missile. So that perhaps it is investigated formally. I do not remember, but this is, as far as I know, the only clear-cut example of a, a general, an Israeli general, that gave an order to shoot consciously hostages. I do not know about other examples. I I, I guess there were some 
uh, mistakes as well, because there are always mistakes in battlefields. I do not know uh, about um, any other cases in which, within Israel, I mean, we do know about some other cases in which the Israeli military shot in Gaza and killed uh, hostages. We do know about some incidents of that. And some parents who lost their uh, dear ones uh, talked about uh, uh, such incidents. But as far as uh, October 7 itself is concerned, and the uh, <coughs> temporary occupation of uh, kibbutzim, etc., by Hamas within the borders of Israel, Israel, as I said, I have no idea apart from this specific uh, uh, incident that uh, was published. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, Israeli society pre-October 7th um uh in the characterization of it um uh, we've, we've definitely heard uh, uh israeli officials or, or former israeli officials refer to it as an apartheid system um what what is your sense of that and explain the you know the, the, why or why not you you would consider it uh an apartheid system for for people who aren't familiar with the dynamics uh in in israel According to the definition of apartheid by the Roman uh, Rome Convention and some other resolutions, the, it is obvious, uh, obviously, there is an apartheid system in the West Bank, and even in East Jerusalem, because there are literally and formally two systems of laws, and the uh, and discriminatory one, of course. One, uh, so, by definition, again, according to the Rome Convention, especially, which, uh, as far as I remember, gave the most profound definition of apartheid, there is apartheid goes goes on uh, in uh, in the West Bank for many years, <clears throat> not only under this government, under other governments. By the way, it's ironically the former government failed specifically because they wanted to cling to the apartheid system. And uh, if you would li like me to explain in further detail, Please. I will. But uh, yeah, so uh, the former government, which uh, called itself in retrospective, perhaps I can say, you know, uh, uh, no, I cannot say cynically, but uh, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. But uh, the former government wanted, uh, or let's begin another way. There are two systems, even more than two systems of laws in the West Bank. In general, the Palestinians are subjected to military rule and, and, uh, and laws, including, for instance, uh, 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 courts. And uh, the uh, Israeli Jews who live in the West Bank, are settlers, they are subjected to civic law and courts. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. There are places in which Jews are allowed to enter, Palestinians are not. There are even specific roads, you know, to Palestinians different, uh, separately than for Jews. And by the way, as, uh, as you remember, probably the very famous verdict of the court in the United States in 56 or 53, the Brown versus Board of Education. So remember the court in the States dictated that or ruled that there's nothing like separate but equal, right. so same here, of course. So, uh, so there is an apartheid. The, the apartheid goes on for sure. Now, <clears throat> uh, according to the Israeli law, every five years the Knesset has to renew those uh, regulations uh, uh, of apartheid. They are formally entitled the uh, Judea and Samaria uh, uh, regulations or rules. I prefer to call them the rules of apartheid. Every five years, that they must be renewed by the Knesset. And uh, the last, in the last Knesset, the coalition didn't have the majority to renew those rules because one member of the coalition uh, refused to vote in favor of uh, the extension of those rules. So if they uh, stayed in power, those rules would have been revoked automatically the only way to renew those rules was by uh, dissolving the knesset so the government preferred to dissolve itself in order to uh, uh, keep 
the apartheid rules. Because otherwise, uh, had those rules expired, um, the uh, Palestinians living in the West Bank would have been subject to civic uh, um, uh, civic no, laws. No, quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. The settlers would have been subjected ah, okay. to, <laughs> to military, to military rules. And by rules. the way, that meant that meant that members of the Knesset and ministers of the former government, who are settlers, would have not been able to be members of the parliament and the government because they would have been referred to as aliens. Interesting. Um, all right. Lastly, what, what, what do you think, what is, what is the way forward? I mean, what, like, how do you imagine, uh, and I imagine it's, it's difficult to, to imagine, but, but, but what is it, what is the way forward? Um, uh, both from a, uh, an idealistic sense, but also from a pragmatic sense? Like, w is there a way out of this? <clears throat> Look, idealistic. <laughs> Ideally, I would embrace uh, John Lennon's imagined song that they imagined there are, there are no countries. Right. And I said that as uh, someone who doesn't like the Beatles, by the way. <laughs> but uh, I'm an heavy metal guy, so what to do. But uh, anyway, uh, that's ideally. Unfortunately, uh, it's not particularly relevant and uh, topical at the moment. Uh, but uh, I think that the balance between the ideal and the practical or realistic is this two-state solution. Uh, uh, there's no other way. Uh, by the way, I always say that uh, once, the, the, once a Palestinian independent state is established, perhaps in the future, upon consent, of everyone involved, there is a chance to, uh, you know, transform the two states into a confederation, federation, one state, together with Jordan, without Jordan, upon consent of everyone. But at the moment, the only way to allow the Palestinians to enjoy their imminent rights, national self-determination, and to stop the bloodshed is by establishing a Palestinian sovereign state in the all territories that Israel occupied in June 1967. That means Gaza Strip, West Bank, is Jerusalem, alongside the state of Israel. But of course, the, the, we also support the democratization of the state of Israel proper. Israel cannot continue to cling to Jewish supremacy. We oppose any kind of supremacy. It's not that we want to change it into a another kind of supremacy. But democracy, that's basics of basis, basic, of course. Democracy is based on equal in on equality. It is an egalitarian modern democracy. I'm not talking about the Athenian one. Modern democracy is a <coughs> is based on the principle of equality. When as long as Israel clings to policies which are by definition anti-egalitarian, it cannot be entitled as a democracy. So there's a two-fold uh, 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 future that should be uh, should re be realized. Two states and democratization of the state of Israel for the sake of both peoples, the Israelis and the Palestinians, Arabs and Jews, we are all entitled to live in security and prosperity. No way to achieve that as long as occupation and racism dominate. Uh, that's, that's well said. And we should say like, you know, that realistically probably has an asterisk. We just had the Knesset, uh, my understanding is vote uh, against the idea of- uh, 99 uh, out of 110, 20 members of the Knesset voted <clears throat> against the apparent one-sided recognition of a Palestinian state, and I emphasize that it is an apparent one, or seeming one, because it's not something like that really doesn't exist, but it, it shows that the, those who pretend to be an alternative to the uh, fascist government of Netanyahu are not exactly an alternative. Uh, Ofer Kassif, um member of the Israeli Knesset, representing the Hadash uh, Coalition. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank uh, you so much. And, uh, My and, pleasure. And, 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 and good Thank luck. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate uh, your, you know, the work you're doing and um, and uh, the courage Thank you. it takes. We keep to, doing that. All right. Thank well, you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Cheers. All right, folks. Uh, we um, we're not going to head into the uh, fun half. I guess it will be a freebie, freebie Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Um, we got about uh, twenty more minutes. I gotta go. We get uh, thank O'Fair for the freebie. So glad we were able to have a conversation Absolutely. with him and get to talk to him. And I just I mean, can't the, the amount break, of courage. The amount. That's what I was to say. The amount of courage. I mean, he says that he could be killed. He feels that way. I mean, for speaking in this way, he is uh, stating facts plainly. But so I, I can't even imagine that, that incredible courage. Um, you know, he made uh, a point about the that there are two sets of laws uh, within the West Bank that are contingent upon your religion and ethnic background. Um, if you are a Jewish settler in the West Bank you are subjected to Israeli civil law. If you are not a Jewish settler, if you are a Palestinian who has lived in the West Bank all their lives, if you are a Palestinian whose parents have lived in uh, the West Bank all their lives, uh, if you are a, uh, a Palestinian within the West Bank, you do not have civil rights you're living under military law. This weekend, in, um, on Sunday, at the uh, Berlinale Film Festival in Berlin, Germany, uh, an award was given to a film entitled No Other Land, which was made by an Israeli Jewish journalist Yuval Abraham and a Palestinian journalist Basil Adra and in accepting the award this is what uh, Yavul Abraham had to say I want to say we are we are standing in front of you now me and Basil are the same age I am Israeli Basil is Palestinian and in two days we will go back to a land where we are not equal I am living under a civilian law, and Basel is under military law. We live 30 minutes from one another, but I have voting rights. Basel is not having voting rights. I'm free to move where I want in this land. Basel is, like millions of Palestinians, locked in the occupied West Bank. This situation of apartheid between us, this inequality, it has to end. I want to say we are we are standing in front of you now. Me and Basel That's are the it. same. And so, I mean, that lays it out pretty clearly that dynamic i don't uh, you know it is it's hard to understand how people cannot accept this notion um i mean this notion was also articulated quite well um when uh, fairly early on uh when um the the author uh on democracy now gosh what's his name the very famous uh writer ta-nehisi coates uh said it in, in, in when speaking about the west bank in particular on democracy now and spoke out about it and apparently the mayor of berlin not a jewish person said that this um speech was anti-semitic that person who just said spoke lost. was an israeli jewish uh, reporter. Yeah, and in in Yuval Abraham's tweet here, he said Israel's Channel Eleven aired this thirty second segment for my speech and called it anti semitic as well. Oh, he so and, he confirmed yeah, that, right? And and uh, just just if you guys recall, Basil Adra was on our program last July mm-hmm. about about this exact what they made this documentary about, which is the destruction and occupying of Masafriyata, where Basil is from in the West Bank. Yeah. And right after our conversation, he was taken by Israeli forces, but then ultimately released. Right. We'll we'll put a link uh, if we clip this. We'll put a link to that interview in that uh, description. Actually, Griscom and I talked to him on Left Reckoning. Um, uh, Left Reckoning one twenty seven. We'll link to that too. Um, speaking of of charges of anti semitism, where uh, there are none, and and the weaponization of these charges as a means in which to stifle any type of uh, support for the humanity of uh palestinians uh just to give you an idea let's uh, put up uh, put up the the picture of um of the dorm room door just the picture itself this is at barnard college yeah this is this is a picture of someone's uh a dorm room door 
in uh, at Barnard College. Every time uh, media lies, a neighborhood in Gaza dies. Um, from the U.S. to Palestine, abolish the settler state. Resist colonial power by any means necessary. Um, uh, I, I support SJP and JVP. Cease fire now. This was deemed to be uh, an offensive display of support. And the um, uh, Columbia, I guess, uh, has decided, or Barnard. Uh, well, Barnard's a part of the Women's College of Columbia. Exactly. Yeah. Um, ends up d banning dorm room door decorations across the board huh. because it is apparently um, rampant and uh, rampantly anti-semitic according to the uh, college now joe rogan would probably agree with that despite being a free speech warrior he's been calling out palestine protests same with barry weiss I mean, yeah. her Does, alma mater is stifling stifling free speech d like never mind those two where are all of the writers from the Atlantic mm -hmm. and the New York Times editorial board and everyone else who was talking about the stifling of free speech on college camp campuses? Um, I mean, this is it, it just goes to show you how much of a, of a of a crock it always was. It is perfectly um, it, within the rights of Barnard to say you can't put stuff on your door. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the college, you cannot put stuff on your door, but the idea that this is a, f a response to supposed anti-Semitic postings that are clearly just in favor of the humanity of Palestinians and the idea that it's a response to the dissenting views, um, while it's within the rights of, of Barnard, if you're going to expel, uh, ink on the rights of college students to say we don't want this guy's uh, hatred to be espoused on this campus how do you not then not start writing article after article about things like this uh it's absurd i, I mean it just it just shows how uh absurd all of that crying a year ago by all these uh you know centrist uh pundits and whatnot never mind the uh reactionaries yeah. like uh like like R rogan or uh barry weiss and barry weiss when she was at columbia was literally trying to yeah. get um uh, professors fired for being supportive of palestinian humanity that was literally what marked her career that was what launched her career yeah it's really especially egregious because of Columbia, because of the fact that like Edward Said's intellectual, um, you know, um, uh, mentee, basically, uh, Rashid Khalidi is a professor there. The, the fact that this is the response from the administration when like you could use this moment to be like, stand out from the crowd and say say be on the right side of history and say, no, this university and, uh, you know, its prominence and its uh all of its uh, endowment and its funding, well, the endowment might be the issue here, but that we can stand for actual intellectual freedom on Palestine because of the like pr uh, prominent scholars that we have had on staff here. And, and no, and no, it's time to stifle dissent. Rashid Khalidi had a good open letter on uh, December 21st um, that I, I'll uh, retweet to the top of my feed uh, now, but I'll also say like Adam Tooze, also tight at Columbia, um, uh, said he wants to associate himself with Khalidi's a devastating critique of the Columbia University, infringement of free speech and blatant bias against pro-Palestinian students. And it's amazing because like, yeah, we have Columbia people all the time on this show uh, doing great work and it's just wild to see an institution ignore those people and right. be like we're going to actually like wind uh, wind in this free speech stuff um all right let's lastly uh turn to cpac um at cpac uh, megan kelly uh sat down with conservative con commentator mercedes schlapp mercedes schlapp is of course the um wife of um what's his what's his name again matt, matt schlapp, schlapp. Matt schlapp. Matt Schlapp, of course, is 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 famous for uh, one uh, being the uh, director of CPAC, and two uh, being in charge of groping uh, Republican operatives 
Um, uh, male Republican male operatives. Male Republican operatives. Allegedly. Uh, allegedly. Uh, that's true. Uh, this is according to uh, Republican operatives. Uh, and um, uh, they uh, somehow uh, he has survived. And their the, marriage has survived. Well, she yeah, just got to take it, I guess. Right. Yeah. Go. Um, <laughs> but here's Megyn Kelly um, at uh, CPAC um, uh, interviewing uh, Mercedes Schla Schlapp. Is where this be begins. So I do think keeping them away from social media in the young formative years and you reinforcing your own values and what's true is important and keeping the right news sources funneling to them so they're hearing facts that you know are real and not left. It's not like, don't leave Al Jazeera on the TV while you go off for your run. <laughs> um, but I, I, Projection. I also think that um, like when they get to the university, they're gonna need to find their spines mm -hmm. and their friends. Mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons why I love Turning Point. Like, you have to get to young people. Yeah. and make sure they know they're not alone. You may feel like you're the only conservative voice on campus, but you're not. The TikTok in particular is a problem because that is really funneling pro-Hamas information and pro-Bin Laden. And pro, yes. You saw that, like, and literally these morons yeah. were like, you, you know that Bin Laden? Really, you have to hand it to that Bin Laden. He has a point. No, you do not have to hand it to Bin Laden. That's right. Can you pause it you for a second? She's doing the drill. She's doing the drill. What do you She's mean? doing the drill bit with a drill um, a Twitter a poster, that. which is, a, I can't remember exactly the post, but it's like, you do it's not. Like in regards to ISIL, you, you do not, in fact, have to hand it to them. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> right. She's doing the media. She's online. She's trying to prove it. But like, that was, there was an analysis done of that Bin Laden TikTok where they read the manifesto. It was artificial and um, hysterical. Yes, and like of the, it was so marginal and compared to all of the other content that was being shared and pro-Palestine content that was being shared, but was whipped up into this frenzy by right-wing media to say like, oh, basically they're terrorists at this point. Um, I just find this to be an interesting reminder of like, Megyn Kelly had this effort to rebrand herself after the whole Trump fiasco where he said that she was bleeding from her eyes, bleeding from her wherever. She resigned from Fox News. She left. And, and a, a big part of it, too, was like her speaking out about Roger Ailes and his sexual harassment of her as well as other women. And so she... Like, NBC hired her. Incidentally. Yes, she went on the Today Show. She, I mean, she doesn't have Disaster. the warmth, honestly, to be a, a a morning show person. That's supposed to be like fun, good times, baking cakes and talking about babies. So she couldn't do that. And now she needs to go back to what she was good at, which is just being a reactionary. Um, so her I whole. I don't know if you remember. Uh, yes, Santa's, her, Santa's, Santa's white. Santa's white. Uh, so yes. Deal yes. with it. Of deal course, I remember. It. Right. <laughs> Deal but, with this uh, imaginary figure being uh, something that is uh, completely fixed in our minds. So I just am kind of, I have a little bit of schadenfreude because she really uh, tried to whitewash her, her past, like, extremely conservative racist past because of the circumstances she was dealt and capitalized on it. And she saw that wasn't very lucrative. And so now she's back to saying, oh, you know, uh, don't make your kids pro-terrorist by watching Al Jazeera. Is there more to this that yeah. we want to watch this? Go. No, you do not have to hand it to Bin Laden. That's right. <laughs> You've got to actually do some study and some homework. So oh, yeah. the, only, the only plus of the anti-Semitism that we've been seeing on college campuses, the only okay. upside to all of this in the wake of the horrific October 7th attack is that our Jewish friends who are more left-leaning and believe the DEI lie, I think are now seeing the truth. Oh, which is that it's pernicious and it's actually really dangerous. And so, like, it's not okay to, whether it's black and white or Hispanic and Jews, whatever, like, it's not okay to divide us by race or ethnicity. Like, we're all the same. That's why I don't like the black national anthem. There's only one national anthem. We don't yes. need it. There's only one, one Santa. Creed. Right? So, in any event, I, I think all that's important messaging, but you, the number one thing is to shore up your child before he gets there. No, that. Wait. Wow. <laughs> I would like to uh, offer some dissent about <laughs> the idea that Jewish students might not want to uh, promote the idea that there's diversity and inclusion. Uh, I suspect that were it not for the concepts of diversity and inclusion, there would be no Jewish students. <laughs> 
at these universities. This is what yeah. Elon Musk said, like it last fall, where he said, "Yeah, that's exactly right." To a white nationalist who's like, "Yeah, well, Jews kind of had this coming because they uh, promoted DEI in the universities." It's like, what? well, I mean, like, like I, exactly correct. What, growing up in New Jersey, there were country clubs that I'd hear about. That literally don't have Jews a part of it. Oh, we know exactly what we're talking about. Also, colleges, frankly. I mean, but yes, yes, yes like there's, there's a- still institutions that don't allow, and like, and also, I mean, black people, please, but still don't even allow Jews in, as a part of their membership. Yeah, uh, that is uh, quite ironic. But also, learn your history. <laughs> Right. Thanks for the lesson in anti-Semitism. Right? Exactly. <laughs> learn your history. Make sure you learn your history. Don't just get it from TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. All these anti-Semitic messages on TikTok. By the way, Jews, don't you feel bad for all the diversity stuff you've been pushing on all of us? She's literally (laughs) saying Jews are leaving the left because uh, college students are pro-Hamas. That's that. That's the argument. Yeah. Also, can we just rewind to like the good thing about all the rise in anti-Semitism we've been seeing? If we have been actually like, I I think it'd be hard to actually say if I actually believe that we've been seeing the rise in like protesters chanting death to jewish people i would not say like well the upside of that is <laughs> like at least we made some good friends <laughs> right amazing amazing um that is amazing her comeback don't call it a comeback um let's uh stay with cpac for a moment we got a couple more minutes uh here um speaking of dei i mean what like they must it, it's like there's something it's some quality about like cpac right now and the entire republican movement i mean when you contemplate like what are they going to what are they running on uh in michigan the polling is uh you know the economy is number one and they are deathly afraid that the economy is improving in some ways uh you, you know the 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 biggest drag, I think, in terms of the way that people are experiencing uh, the, the economy, is uh, the cost of housing uh, in this country. Um, like I would say, in terms of like one universal uh, issue, um, it's unclear. It doesn't appear to be anything that's that's happening in terms of of doing that. It, it's conceivable that if uh, interest rates are dropped. Uh, over the course of the next year, you'll see rents come down a little bit because people will be able to sell their houses and then people will be able to buy houses, et cetera, et cetera, and that'll free up some of the rentals. We'll see. We need more housing, though, in general. But <laughs> from the perspective of the Republican Party, the only affirmative thing that they are arguing for is some variation of racism or xenophobia. Uh, and it's like, it, it, and you see it in that... Um, Megan Kelly clip where she's like, it's DEI. And that's what Jews really are coming to realize. You don't want to have uh, any type of like representation right. of uh, people in institutions. <laughs> um, but it's almost like, it's almost like a, a maypole where like every single issue they have is attached to it. And they yes. just keep walking around it and walking around it. And it's all tied back into this. Uh, but here is the Maypole himself, Stephen Miller, uh, talking about what Donald Trump is going to do in, in terms of immigration. It is the the race between the two uh, um, presumptive candidates to prove that they hate immigrants more is fascinating, particularly since we know that the economy is greatly improved. Yeah. by the presence of immigrants yeah. that the american public by and large um are supportive of immigrants it is just that the uh, the Even democratic both parties party, like want to act like there's some sort of uh, rivalrous nature between exactly, immigrants and american workers exactly and the democratic party at least you know um uh, as of late has decided that they're going to concede that there is some type of crisis going on as opposed to a crisis of our simply having the apparatus in which to deal with it. There is not a, you know, we don't have a, um, uh, uh, we didn't have a problem with taxation when the IRS was underfunded. We had a problem in collecting exactly. taxes. 
our, our system of, of processing migrants is threadbare, underfunded, not uh, completely archaic. It needs to be modernized and standardized so that we can get people to make their asylum claims formally. You don't decide we're not going to have taxes anymore yes. because I IRS is underfunded and therefore we can't collect them. No, you fund the IRS. And that's what you do. Also, we should just say, like, America is not the only place where people are being displaced to. Like, you look at around the Great Lakes region of Africa or around, say, Ukraine and Poland. Like, a lot of places are dealing with displaced people. Um, we, uh, we've we displaced uh, many ourselves, actually, if you look closer. So that's an important thing. It's not just, like, the West being flooded here. Here is uh, Stephen uh, Miller, the, the maypole, if you will, of the uh, Republican uh, Party's stance on immigration. We're going to end with this non-controversial topic, immigration. Uh, we have President Biden importing Pause it one second. The, the funny part about this is that there is no controversy at that, uh, in that building. Unfortunately, yeah. There is no controversy. You will not hear, uh, when Stephen Miller uh, lays out the plan, you will not hear a single person go, Boo! Yeah, the controversy is whether we should, like, uh, shoot immigrants on sight or allow them to drown in the Rio Grande uh, by being cut by razor wire. We're going to end with this non-controversial topic, immigration. Uh, we have President Biden importing 10 million people into this country. These, a lot of these people are unvetted. They don't share our values. They don't want to assimilate many of them. And so I'm going to start this with Stephen Miller, who's been the tip of the spear on immigration. What should we be doing in a Trump 47 administration to fix this disaster, this invasion of our southern border? Well, as I, as I say sometimes, the immigration issue is extremely simple. The policies involved in fixing it are very complicated. The simple part is seal the border, deport all the illegals. Now, <laughs> very controversial. That's the, that's the short answer, right? It's very, you get in, you have two policy objectives that you proceed with uh, utter determination on. Seal the border, no illegals in, everyone here goes out. That's very straightforward. In terms of the policy sets to accomplish this, as President Trump showed in his first term, True. It's, it's, a, it's a series of interlocking domestic and foreign policies to accomplish this goal. In no particular order, just to rattle off a few fast, you have your safe third agreements, you have remain in Mexico, finish the wall, you have robust prosecutions of illegal aliens, you do interior repatriation flights to Mexico, not back to the north of Mexico. Okay. It's very important. You re-implement Title 42. You have several muscular 212Fs. That's the travel ban authority. We did a few of those in the Trump administration. You would bring those back and add new ones on top of that. You would establish large-scale staging grounds for removal flights. So you grab illegal immigrants, and then you move them to the staging grounds. And that's what the planes are waiting for federal law enforcement to then move those illegals home. You deputize the staging National Guard ground. to carry out I, yeah. immigration enforcement. And then you also deploy the military to the southern border, not just with a mission to observe, but with an impedance and denial mission. In other words, you reassert the fundamental constitutional principle that you don't have a right to enter into our sovereign territory to even request the asylum claim. The military has the right to establish a fortress position on the border and to say no one can cross here at all. Yes. Oh, that's a smug look. What is a what would a large scale sca staging ground look like? I mean, just let's think about it. And we don't want them to leave, right? So we got to stage them in a place, warehouse Ooh, them. Would you concentrate them? Put in? a little fence around. Yeah, yeah. You would have to have guards on the outside, and then also the forces that are going around to find the illegals, right? Like they are, they could be a special task force, a special police force, if you would. Um, you know, I don't want to call them a, the Gestapo, but a special police force that would go in throughout the country with hundreds of millions of people and go into homes and see, are you housing illegals here? W what are you doing? That kind of thing. Um, the thing that strikes me about what he's saying is just you're seeing the level of sophistication that uh, these uh, Trump people have after four years in terms of on day one, they're going to get in. And that guy who was interviewing, incidentally, was Mike Davis, uh, who is part of the Article 3 project, right? That's 2025 uh, yeah, yeah, mission. Exactly, exactly. And uh, that mission, you know, we're, we're, I, in the coming months, we'll go through it more extensively. But it is really, really disturbing stuff. One of the guys who, who wrote it also, a uh, huge theocrat. I mean, this is the thing is that 
we hear this as if it's like some type of like um you know uh trump project at least the the ideas of it like this is the maga people this is the republican party the heritage foundation has been the cornerstone of the republican party for decades and um uh, every you know every one of those judges that donald trump pointed came from the heritage foundation the the, the heritage foundation was last uh, headed by a um a republican congress um, a senator i should say i mean this is not this is the republican party it's just that the uh people that trump will install will be loyal to his brand within the republican party um and they're now far more sophisticated in terms of they know where the levers of government are they know how to operate it there's not going to be uh you know some type of ramp up they're not going to be crawling before they learn to walk before they learn to run yeah they're going to come in day one run and i just want to say one more thing like the whole premise of this this thing that like the republican uh anti-immigration uh sentiment is uh, america first and our people first et cetera, et cetera. I mentioned this briefly yesterday but in texas where they have these razor wires uh they have just decided that 3.8 million children in texas will miss out on a chance for a hundred and twenty dollars worth of food per person from grocery stores farmer markets and other locations under a USDA program, there will be 21 million children across the country who are going to receive a total of 2.5 million benefits. Um, Hawaii, New York, Guam, American Samoa, uh, 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 Osage uh, Nation, and more. Um, children 18 years or, ol or old or younger are eligible to join the program free of charge with a specific uh, uh, emphasis on low-income families. Each month, families will receive $40 per child available on a prepaid card, and the government plans to cover half the administrative fees for participating schools so that they can eat during the summer when there's no student, uh, you know, lunch programs. And Texas, they're too busy spending their money and ex expelling their efforts on uh, razor wire in the Rio Grande. Yeah, right. And when he talks about the expulsion, by the way, the, the ones that were under the Trump administration, Biden is trying to reinstitute those for himself. So unfortunately, to your point at the beginning of this, there is not enough daylight between what Biden is proposing and what Trump is proposing. I mean, there's oh, there's degrees of that would be horrific what Miller's describing, but Biden is still conceding some of those points, which, which is disturbing. Ground, yeah. yep. um, and, you know, there, what Miller went on a big list there and he didn't... Uh, name anything to do with enforcement against capitalists who would exploit uh, uh, undocumented labor. And that's because his boss, Donald Trump, I read Wayne Barrett's the uh, um, book on Trump, uh, The Greatest Show on Earth or something, I can't remember what it's called, but Wayne Barrett's book on Trump. Trump Tower was built using Polish workers who were undocumented. Those workers got asbestos, they got stiffed, they got upset to the point that they threatened to kill the representative Trump had uh, hiring them. And you know what Trump did? He called ICE, because that's what it's actually for. Yep. It's for bosses uh, when they have uppity labor, uppity un undocumented labor, to call them, get them out. It's not about actually enforcing the law, as all these people like to say. All right, we're going to read some IMs and then uh, get going. I don't have much time. Sorry, folks, I didn't uh, organize that well. Free Palestine says uh, conservatives hate IVF because they think women who got it are 30 to 40 year olds who should have gotten pregnant at 18 or 16 if you're Matt Walsh. Uh, any agency shown by women feels apocalyptic to them. That's a good point. Um, Disco Asylum. Uh, I had a poli sci professor from undergrad who wrote pieces for the Heritage Foundation. I think the piece was about the dangers of equity or something. Hogtown, considering the history of successful labor advocates in the U.S., I hope Sean Fain has a good security detail. The man is a national treasure. Dave from Ja. Bob Costa, you don't have black lung and, and a pickaxe. Uh, Cole from uh, Michigan. Um, isn't looking at the bright side of anti-Semitism a tradition of people named Mercedes? God. Oh, God. Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. 
That was well done. Dick Derman, super fan. Sam, I'm really struggling with parenting problem that I think you know how to handle. Would you appreciate taking my call if you can? 434 area code. Sorry, we didn't take calls today. Uh, Rhonda Stick, if you know of a, ca- a California campaign similar to the uncommitted in Michigan, I-, I am sure those campaigns are going on. I know there's one in Colorado. We'll talk more about that uh, in the in the coming uh, days and weeks. Uh, Minnesota guy, I normally vote for harm reduction, but this election I can't in good conscience vote for a perpetrator of industrial scale genocide. I'll probably vote ceasefire in this election. It's just scary because the alternative isn't any better. But being coerced into pulling a lever uh, for psychopathic murderers has its limits. Well, I mean, all I can tell you is, uh, you know, we had a caller uh, a month or maybe a month ago, uh, a Palestinian American who also identified as a progressive. And he said he doesn't want, he's a member of multiple communities. He doesn't want to hurt uh, those, uh, those members of those communities that he's also a member of as a progressive. Um, uh, while, you know, expressing his rage, uh, at, uh, the, uh, administration support for Biden's support for Israel's, uh, committing of this genocide. Um, you know, you listen to him and uh, decide, I mean, I don't know where ultimately he's going to decide either, frankly, but, um, I think he, he lays it out, uh, quite well. Yeah, just make the sure dilemma. either way you turn out for like Ilhan and, uh, Robin right. Wands and people like that, whatever right. you decide. Paint chip tester. Am I to believe that a man protesting genocide is mentally ill and those cheering on said genocide are sane? Mike from Texas. Um, kudos uh, to Ofer. I can't read everybody's IMs. I, mean, you know, I can't read all of the ones that, uh, but kudos to Ofer for uh, calling out Hamas rightly for what they are a fanatic, bigoted bunch of criminals led by corrupt assholes. And like some people who are unironically called them a political liberation organization with a military wing. I mean, uh, I, I, I don't know that uh, how deep into uh, uh, it, you know, we could have gotten deeper into it with Ofer. But um, yeah. I, I, would, I think that might overstate that. I think some of the dumb people you're referring to are like people like Avi Schleim or Ilan Papi or just diplomats in the world. Like they, they, are, they engage in terrorism. That's to be condemned. You can also recognize that it's a resistance group. I don't know how you would have referred to the IRA, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, Lydia Rose, a major update to Transvia uh, Virginia Healthcare dropped on Friday. Would love to call in from uh, 315 to discuss. We're not taking calls today. Sorry. BRB forever. Uh, regarding bin Laden, Israel's decision to just indiscriminately kill Palestinians and blame them all for October 7th is exactly the mindset of the September exactly. 11th attacks. Collective all right, uh, two more. El Conniption, why are you calling people maples? I don't get it. And the final I am of the day. Congressional baseball fan, it doesn't matter if you're black or white unless you're Santa. Megan Kelly all the way with the Ys. I'm not sure I get it. Bradley, (laughs) Matt, Emma, great job today. Folks, we will see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar Choices made for the option where you don't get paid.